this evening for the second River Road Restoration Public Meeting. Um, real quick, my name is Brian Mast and I'm with the San Antonio River Authority. At this time I'd like to introduce your County Commissioner, uh, Mr. Justin Rodriguez. Uh, he'd like to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and I promise to be very, very brief because uh, I know you have a long presentation ahead of you. Uh, but I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving, and, and uh, I know it was it, it was uh, hard as it was for me to get back to the regular business yesterday. We had commissioners court today, a long meeting. Uh, but but I wanted to simply come by and show my support. I think what we're doing here is is uh, supremely important work. Uh, we we've, we've talked about the uh, ecosystem restoration that has been done on the south side of the river. I know Suzanne and her team at Sarah have done a great job. With, I'm sorry, I'm Justin Rodriguez. I should have said, I should have led with that. Justin Rodriguez, I'm County Commissioner, Precinct 2. Um, actually, it'll be a year next month that I've been your County Commissioner. You all know Paula Lizondo uh, for a long time represented Precinct 2. When he passed away, I was, I was uh, appointed in January to replace him and try to fill his very big shoes. Uh, but I wanted just to come by and lend my support to Sarah, the Army Corps. This is a very, very important process. Uh, the most important part of this process is public input to make sure that we are engaging uh, and empowering our communities to give their ideas on the best practices and how we move forward. Um, I will tell you from the county's perspective, Sarah's been a great partner. We work with the Army Corps on a number of flood control projects over the years. Um, I simply wanted to come by and show my support um, and make sure that the county was at the table because ultimately we all are on the same page and trying to make sure we do the right thing here. Um, I wanted you all to know uh, from my perspective that you have my support and we'll be here from the county and we've talked about actually uh, doing some future partnering as well. We worked a lot on the creekways, the trailways. Uh, we were engaging in, in similar conversations on the west side and on the east side. This is equally important to make sure that we're giving those opportunities for uh, this great neighborhood that I'm very, very fortunate to represent here at River Road. So thank you very much, and I will pass it back on to the River Authority. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Erin Teed, the project manager on behalf of the San Antonio River Authority. And thank you very much for coming out and providing your input and your thoughts tonight. A couple of housekeeping items. The presentation and meeting will be filmed in its entirety by Nowcast SA, and it will be available for your viewing um, and sharing on YouTube later on. Uh, please do sign in at your table. There's a sign-in sheet. Please make sure that it uh, is legibly written so that we know how to get a hold of you and send you with your feedback. So, I would like to provide an overview of how our meeting will be conducted tonight uh, before we get into the, the presentation. What we're going to start off with is a brief presentation that's going to provide an overview of the project, help refresh our memories from our last public meeting, and then we're going to have our table sitting sessions. At your session, you'll notice that we have some very big map, maps. There will be a facilitator that will come to each uh, table and we'll work through each of our uh, three big project areas, either roads, uh, low water crossings and stream restoration, and then vegetation and recreation elements, our restoration protection elements. You'll rotate through. You get to stay, you'll have a facilitator that will uh, rotate through, through. So we'll have three sessions at the table at 15 minutes each. After we're done with those, then we're gonna reconvene in the big group and we'll have a report out where the facilitators will help share with the big group what the individual conversations were. And then after that, we'll dive into a more informal Q&A sessions uh, in small groups or in large, however, that uh, comes organically to address specific comments and questions that y'all might have. Do y'all have any questions about the format of our meeting tonight? All right, then I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Danny Allen, who is going to walk us through the project overview. Thank you. Uh, my name is Danny Allen. I'm a wildlife biologist with the Army Corps of Engineers, and I like to break things. <laughs> um, 
I specialize in ecosystem restoration. I apologize for not being at the last meeting. I had another project I had, had a commitment to. Um, but I thought we'd just refresh everybody of what's going on and what, uh, what this project is all about. Uh, when the Corps of Engineers goes into doing an ecosystem restoration study, we always look at what the problem is, the underlying problem is with the system. And so for this project, we've identified um, that the, the, uh, the stream is not balanced with its, the uh, streams naturally erode, they naturally uh, have sediments deposited, um, uh, but that could be out of balance. And that's what we're seeing on the River Road uh, section of the San Antonio River. There's excessive erosion, there's excessive deposition of sediments. And so, and then with that disturbance caused by that imbalance in the stream, it opens up the avenue for invasive species to come in and get a stronghold in the habitat. So that's the problems we're trying to address. And so, uh, in order to get a solution, our objective is to restore that aquatic form and function of, of the river. Um, we're doing that through um, uh, restoring the aquatic function, but we're looking at it as a system approach as well. So we're not only looking at the stream itself, but we're looking at the riparian habitat and when I say riparian, what I mean is it's habitat that wouldn't otherwise be there if the stream wasn't there. So it requires the wetter soils for that vegetation to grow. So any of that vegetation that is influenced by that stream, we refer to that as riparian vegetation, riparian habitat. Or you could think of it as river habitat. Um, when we look at these studies, we also look for opportunities that we're actually not looking to solve within the study, but there's things that we can get from it by doing that restoration. Things like uh, recreation, ecotourism, uh, along those lines. So we try to identify what those opportunities may be as well. So I want to kind of go over the core problem. Can history. I ask you, Rob, are, we, are these slides going to be available to us? Yes. The yes, PowerPoint. this PowerPoint. The, the PowerPoint will be posted on the project website that's hosted by the San Antonio River Authority. How do we find it? There's a whole lot of stuff there. There's 158 pages there. How do we find it? This is a nice PowerPoint. So there is uh, a project card. Uh, Caitlin, did you uh, show one? If you provide your email address on the sign-in sheet, you will receive the presentation. We will email it out to everybody that okay. signs in. Yeah, the, the table sign-in sheet? Yes, yes ma'am. Thank you. Wonderful. Please write that to the Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, you're, you're, yeah. you're okay. Um, so I wanted to kind of lay out what this core process is and, and where we're sitting um, in that process. And those, when the Corps of Engineers looks to do any study, be it flood risk management or ecosystem restoration, there's typically three phases in that project life uh, span. Um, the first phase is what we're in right now. It's the feasibility study. Uh, or feasibility phase. So we look at what the problems are, we look at what solutions we have, and then we identify is there a solution that's within the federal interest that's acceptable with a non-federal sponsor? Um, is there a, a plan to go forward that is, that is viable? Um, the second phase of that, which uh, will happen after the feasibility phase, is the pre-engineering con pre con uh, construction, or the pre-engineering design and construction. Uh, phase, and that's where we do the detailed design. So that will happen in a couple of years uh, if we get funding to go forward through that phase. So right now we're only funded through the feasibility stage. Uh, if the Corps receives funding for those subsequent uh, phases and the uh, River Authority wants to participate further, then we'll go into those next stages. But right now we're just looking at the feasibility. And so that, the second phase is where we do that detailed design of exactly what this restoration is going to look like, the fine details of how we're going to do it. Um, and then the third phase is the construction phase. We actually go and build it. We implement the restoration measures that we've got. So right now, as I mentioned, we're in the feasibility stage. Um, we're identified some preliminary alternatives, and then we'll start uh, putting those together in different combinations and uh, do what's essentially a cost-benefit analysis. I'll get more into that on the next slide. Uh, the construction design and construction process is typically a two to three year, especially for a project this size. Um, after that, it, uh, we turn it over to the non-federal sponsor um, uh, or a, a group of uh, responsible parties for that operation and maintenance. Uh, the core, in combination with whoever that uh, non-federal sponsor that's participating in the construction phase of it, uh, we develop an operations and maintenance plan that identifies exactly what to do if uh, 
something isn't functioning like it should, how to go back and fix it, um, and identifying what those triggers are. When do we actually go in and try to fix something? Do we let things try to restore naturally, or what's the trigger that we have to go back and physically do something? All of that's lined out in the operation maintenance plan. Um, the project becomes a federal project in perpetuity, uh, uh, and so the Corps of Engineers will come out and inspect things annually to make sure that the restoration is functioning like it was planned and designed to do. We do the same thing for Mission Reach. We'll go out annually and we'll inspect Mission Reach and, and we'll have that discussion on is this working, is this not working, or is it still functioning. So just because the project's complete doesn't mean that the project just ends right there. It's actually maintained and operated as an ecosystem function. And so the feasibility phase is kind of a convoluted flow chart, um, but it typically goes through uh, as soon as uh, the non-federal sponsors, the SARA, approaches us and say, we want to do this study, we would like to participate and have your involvement. Uh, the first thing we do is we meet with our resource agencies. We meet with Fish and Wildlife Service, Texas Parks and Wildlife, Texas Council on Environmental Quality, uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, uh, we, we try to bring in all the experts uh, in the natural resource world to the table, identify, uh, like I said, what's wrong with this system, what are some potential fixes or recommendations, and not only that, we have to be able to calculate the habitat benefits that we'll receive in the future because we have to have some measure of how we will improve the habitat to go along with this cost-benefit analysis. So we have to know the benefits as well as the cost. So we meet with those resource agencies on how to best do that, how to best characterize this that. Um, we have the public meeting, what we typically do, and which was at the last meeting. We try to get public comments or input on uh, potential restoration measures that maybe the professionals are just overlooking. You know, maybe there's something uh, locally that we just don't think about. And so we get that input, and we take all of that, and we start putting together different combinations of things that we could do restoration-wise and try to build uh, different alternatives or different plans um, that, will, that will address the, the restoration need. Um, uh, we, we're, we're doing this second meeting because we've kind of come up with some uh, strategies, I'll put. They're not necessarily specific alternatives of how we're planning to do things, but they're different strategies. And once we get additional comments from you guys, we'll actually fine tune those and develop that into more of a final array of alternatives that we can, we can develop. Um, once we do that, we have a milestone meeting with our leadership. Uh, and so we present to them after we do the cost benefit analysis and we kind of come up with this is going to be the plan that's in uh, that is a good expenditure of taxpayers dollars for the benefits, the ecosystem benefits that we get out of it. We present that plan to our leadership um, and uh, they uh, uh, agree to uh, whatever that recommended plan is and then we go forward with that and uh, complete our draft report which will be set out for public comment. And in concert with that, uh, we'll also have another public meeting and present what that final recommended alternative is that we have. And, and again, seek additional comments and recommendations. And before the final document goes out sometime in the fall of 2020, uh, we will incorporate or address uh, those, those comments and try to, uh, within our authority, within our, uh, within the restoration. Real quick, just to make sure everyone's clear, um, at that initial uh, public meeting back in August, we presented to you some general ideas and approaches for doing the restoration. We collected the, the input, and then tonight what you're seeing is the, the result of that input process and some further consideration by the core experts of some more defined strategies or alternatives to the project. We're hoping that you can help provide more input on these specific strategies so that it will help guide the, the core as they go through that cost-benefit analysis and present a tentatively selected plan for uh, their leadership's decision. So that's our purpose for tonight. But real quick, we wanted to make sure to refresh everyone's memory with our uh, first public meeting, which was back in August, to go, to go over those general project approaches. And the, we heard loud and clear from y'all that y'all had some very definite uh, concerns and some definite wants from the project. 
Uh, overall, there was 25 comments submitted. Uh, over 40% of those were concerned with pedestrian access and the, the need to maintain pedestrian access uh, through the park area. Other items of concern were addressing the invasives and how that would impact birding and other uh, maintaining a natural stream and then also addressing the erosion and how it impacts the natural function of the river in this reach. So that helped guide what you see tonight. All right, so uh, one of the comments that we've received so far is, you know, what is the, what are the funding limitations? Where's the funding coming from? Um, and how does that work? Um, so for ecosystem restoration, uh, we're working under the Section 206 of the Water Resources Development Act, which authorizes the Corps of Engineers to uh, address e uh, aquatic ecosystem restoration needs throughout the country. It's one of the operations we have, have for ecosystem restoration. And Section 26, 206 is what we call a continuing authorities program. Um, and essentially that gives us the ability to do relatively small projects within the core realm of thinking and do so in a relatively quick manner. Um, and so it, it gives us a lot more leeway on being able to, uh, we don't have to seek congressional authority to get uh, funding for the next phases of the project. We can actually do that um, at our uh, major support and command level. Um, so the important thing for everyone to remember is that how this how the federal, the federal funds were allocated for this project. Our, their funding is specific to aquatic ecosystem restoration. So that's what we're focused on tonight, is restoration of the river, because that's where the money came from. And, and because it's a continuing authority program, there's some limitations to that. The first of which is there's a cap on the amount of money that we can spend uh, for both the feasibility phase, the design phase, and the construction phase, uh, which is which is capped at a $10 million federal uh, share of that. And a lot of that money is usually cost shared at 65, 55, there's, or 35, unless you want 55, <laughs> yeah, 65, 35. So, and then there's some different cost shares depending on what phase that you're in or what you're doing, but, but essentially that's what it is. And, and Aaron mentioned that it is an aquatic ecosystem restoration authority, but within the realm of that authority, we're allowed to do uh, recreation features as, as a part of that. Uh, and so that's being taken into account for this project as well. All right, so just to refresh everybody's memory, our study area essentially is between Mulberry and 281, um, expanding either side of the river. And, uh, and, I, and I mentioned that we're looking at specific strategies, and we'll call them alternatives or plans for the sake of this presentation here. But there's three different things that we're looking at as far as the, the restoration project. Um, the first is uh, restoring the stream, um, the physical uh, aquatic and uh, riparian or riverine habitats of the stream itself. And we're looking at doing that through a couple of different ways, uh, modification of little water crossings or in-stream structures to help redirect some of the flow of the river. Um, and so those are more of the stream-specific uh, group of alternatives. Um, and then we're looking at two different uh, uh, strategies or alternatives for the roads on either side, Avenue A and River Road, and looking to uh, somehow modify those to increase, primarily increase the, the riparian width of, of that corridor. Um, and again, we're looking at recreational opportunities, um, uh, but, the, but the, the selection of whatever uh, ecosystem restoration plan that eventually comes out um, doesn't take into consider recreation activities. Those are kind of a, a after uh, looking at those, um, including those um, as, as part of the project. So we're, we're looking at specifically looking at the ecosystem restoration and then coming back in and seeing how we can implement recreation features along with that. And then finally on this is we do that ecosystem restoration, we've got to protect that restored area. Um, so there's going to be some uh, control of the access to keep, um, to, to keep the river from being overused or degraded uh, because of uh, 
of, of, of some of the other impacts to it. And so let's go into each one of those uh, strategies a little bit. Um, and so the first one is the modification or replacement of the low water crossings. As we mentioned before, the, the, the authority gives us um, the guidance to uh, do aquatic uh, restoration. And part of that restoration is restoring the stream as much as we can um, to the extent possible, uh, which includes uh, modifying or removing some of the low water crossings because they're backing up water um, and impacting the natural stream bed. Um, they're obstructing fish passage, so we have to address some of that aquatic function. So we're looking at both either the removal or a modification of those low water crossings while still maintaining pedestrian access across those bridges. We don't want to take away that, that the pedestrian impacts. Yeah, I have a question about that. You know, it's in the sense of the low crossing actually acts like a dam. Right. So when we do this to improve the flow, how low are we looking then at the water level? So right now you have a river there. I mean, it's really because of there's some of the damming effects and then it goes over. When you take that away, then what are we looking at? Are we doing something downstream to maintain a water level? Or are we going to just have a low creek there? It would so. be converting it back to the natural stream. So what stream is going to be coming So, So the uh, river in that section, what we're trying to, to achieve is um, the natural form and function of it. So a reestablishment of a, uh, what we refer to as a pool river run sequence. So that it does have pools. What you have at Woodlawn is a very, very large pool that's unnatural and has contributed to some of the degradation of the river over time. The loss of habitat, some of the erosion, um, the water level has increased unnaturally. In the river, there's going to be pools like that, but not to that extent. So there's, are, there's going to be deeper sections, there's going to be sh shallower sections. And the, in the design process, we would be identifying different sections that would have those pools and have it slightly deeper. And then sections where in order to convey the water safely and keep the banks from eroding, it's going to be a little shallower. Dr. Reed. One of my confusions is, is the original stream went through the golf course and in 1932 it was channeled. And that the low water, the water, lawn, the water, the the, um, the low water crossing that we have at Woodlawn was put in there to prevent the entire stream just stripping down through the channel. And and I, I, are we? We're not talking about re, re, re rutting the tr streams through the golf course, are we? No. What we're talking about is by modifying the low water crossings in sequence and then putting in additional in-stream structures. Um, being able to restore that flow in a way that it protects the banks so it can, can safely flow through that section of the river. So we don't have those concerns about it stripping or eroding our banks. Yes, sir. Uh, the low water crossing functions more as a dam than just a crossing. To maintain yes. the water level all the way back up to the head level. It is necessary that, it, that some damage is done there to maintain a water level all the way back up through Brenton Ridge Park. Actually, and if you remove that with a pedestrian bridge or something like that, you know, SAWS pumps water during dry times to keep that river flowing. Do you realize that they would have to increase the pumping of water during normal times? So, in order to maintain a water level? So the requirement for sauce to pump um, to maintain is to maintain a particular flow. The magic number is 10 CFS or cubic feet per second. Mm -hmm. So that flow would go through and by having the natural flow through there, it would be perfect, it would be functioning appropriately and that maintain maintaining the flow through there would not impact um, the, the natural ne and necessary level of river. There's an outlet on the side of the low water crossing slash dam. Removing that, we have seen a decrease in water level all the way back up through Birkenridge Park of about two feet, which exposes a lot more bank than we currently are having exposed. Yes. yes. There will be some decreases in the water level. And that would help 
restore those banks by allowing the vegetation to come in, take root, and help protect those banks, and also help create an, a natural functioning form and uh, stream bed diversity that would provide the aquatic habitat for the species, the native species that we're looking for, while at the same time allowing to have the, the function of the stream bank and have it protected from further erosion. Yes. So do you have any pictures of, of what you think has uh, happened to the sides of the river that wouldn't happen if we did anything? I mean, is there some pictures that you have of, from the river, center of the river that would show what it is that's not right? That I'm really glad you asked that question. I don't know if anyone was, uh, was looking at the slideshow before we all got started. And it had pictures that were taken from a kayak in the river, and it showed some of those degraded banks that are uh, from a result of the unnatural flow through there. There's some fairly she sheer banks that have eroded. You can see a lot of the mature trees that have been lost over time because of that erosion and because of the unnatural uh, function of the river at that point, where it's just not functioning appropriately. Well, can and you show us those? Why don't you go back to this? Yeah. Just so we can, because uh, who goes in the river? I know you have. But I broke it. I broke it. Thank you, Caitlin. I have a related question. Yes. So you're talking about the lower river level. So is there a corresponding for, say, every six inches that it decreases? How much does the width that is going to vary based on the design process. And at this point, it's so preliminary that I wouldn't be able to give you an accurate and um, specific answer. But in answer. general, the more you lower the river level, the, the less wide it is, would that be the true state? Um, not necessarily, because there could be shallow sections that are quite wide, because it goes through what we refer to as a ripple. If you think about um, uh, how sometimes you have that iconic river sequence where it just kind of ripples over very pretty um, and you can see the little lines of the water as it flows. That's generally a ripple and those are generally shallower. Uh, where it, uh, you're going to have some sections that are going to be pools and they could be wider or narrower just depending on what's necessary to convey the, the flow of water and sediment. So. Yes. And I, I want to repeat my question as a statement. The river was, was changed in 1932, which is, which is why this, this low water crossing was put in, to protect the river above that. Removing that returns it to a natural state it never was. Okay? The hope of re rerouting it through the golf course is not possible. And consequently, what you're trying to do is engineer something that never existed. And we fear that the water will whoosh down and we'll be left with six, inch six inches of water running through our neighborhood. Right. Right. May, may I ask why, why you're answering these minutes. questions? If the Army Corps of Engineers is the one doing the design, the planning, and so forth, why, why when everybody starts asking questions, are you answering them and not the Army Corps guy? So as, as part of this project, Sarah is a team member with the Corps of Engineers, so they provide different uh, services as an in-kind, uh, so that, that they can provide part of their cost share as in-kind services. But if you're the one doing the design, why is she answering the question? Why are so the San Antonio answer? River Authority is doing the, the hydraulics and hydrology, the engineering part of the river itself, um, and we're providing oversight on that. So uh, the river authority. So we're a collaborative yeah. team. We work yeah. together quite closely. And the answer is Dr. Woodlock. Because I'm a biologist and she's an engineer. Dr. Tree is very experienced in natural channel design and stream restoration, and so she's lending her expertise to the Corps of Engineers working in this area, understanding the habitat, the soils, the way streams function, especially in an urban environment. So she's she's written our natural channel design manual, uh, both versions of it. Uh, she's incredibly knowledgeable, and so she's kind of helping to lend her expertise. So could you just sell through these things like land grant problem, everything's good, next slide, uh -huh. Okay, so what you're seeing here 
is where the where you have the overhanging banks and you see the, the large tree where it's beginning to fall in. That's a result of the erosion and from having that unnatural depth of water where the Google, uh, stream is not functioning. Uh, you can see some of the erosion starting uh, back on the, the left where it's gonna, it's exacerbating, it's gonna get worse. Um, you have no vegetation on this section, so you have nothing protecting those banks. And as that goes forward, it begins to shear and get those sheer banks and it just, it's just gonna get worse. As water starts hitting that section, it's gonna keep on eroding. And you notice that you have those tree roots. Well, you don't have any other roots that are to help hold that soil in place. And as the water comes through with high events, it's going to loosen that soil, erode it, and it's going to contribute further. So part of, the, part of the problems here is what you can see is that that vegetation, that uh, repairing buffer or stream buffer has been uh, narrowed over time because of the, the use off of the Avenue A. And it's exacerbating the situation. This here's a good photo of where you have a little bit of time, but that tree is gonna come eventually. Um, here's at the, at the low water crossing where it's starting to undermine. Um, it's eroding out, so the structure is starting to show some concerning uh, behaviors. And you can see how it's coming across, over along the edge um, and coming underneath. So there's, it, it needs some TLC. It needs some attention in some way, shape, or form. And along that bank, you can see that the the previous um, ideas to address the erosion uh, are, they're past their time. They're, they're not functioning anymore. Doesn't most erosion happen during flooding times? I mean, isn't this, is erosion and flooding? So erosion actually will happen in everyday flows. Um, a, a channel will form itself and actually will have uh, quite a bit of erosion in low flows or not necessarily low flows, but smaller stream flow events. For instance, the one year or two year events, what you would assume that you have like one event a year. For us, that would be about an inch and a half to two inches. And that's gonna produce a, a good amount of erosion. And those are gonna happen every year and are going to contribute and add and stack on top of each other. You are going to have some erosion that's significant with flood events, but those are gonna happen um, maybe once every five, maybe ten years. So take a, it's the um, death by a thousand cuts concept. You can have a little bit that happens very often and then one massive thing. And you can lose just as much with that every year sort of event. So those are uh, quite steep banks um, down in the lower section near the golf course. Um, you can see where the, there's very little vegetation, most of it is just shallow rooted, um, and it's, it's starting to, to overhang and fall in on itself. Yes, sir. Yes, my name is Jim Saunders, and I'm going back to 1932, where was the point of deviation from the natural channel? At which point was the river deviated? Because actually, from that point on, we're trying to create an engineered example that will hold. Nothing. That's a very good question. Um, the river was straightened from a, um, just below the woodline crossing straight through. If you look at the aerial of the golf course, you can kind of see some old remnant ponds. And that generally follows what the, the river naturally was at, prior to, 19, to the 1930s. Thank you. But that was just a thought on that. I have a map on that D24 that shows exactly the, the river channel. Mm -hmm. For anybody who wants to see it. Do you have an example of what you've got previously that we could see? We can put, uh, put something together for you. We have a demonstration project on East Salatrio Creek where uh, the River Authority uh, took a stream that was in quite uh, bad shape uh, and did a stream restoration. And that was uh, 
about seven years ago, and it is fully restored, and uh, I would be happy to share that example. Let's go on a field trip. trip. Yeah. Yeah, so we can see, we can talk to people who experienced it, we can see before and after. Absolutely. I, could, I would love to show you the before and after photos. <laughs> like San Pedro Creek. You will have a river. It, um, at, it, at the low flow, it's not going to fall below 10 CFS, which is a significant flow. It's going to look to, uh, slightly different than the, the large uh, pool that you're used to. But if you go just a little ways down uh, past that pool and how it flows like that, it's presumably going to look quite um, similar to that which is uh, fairly, it, it's a fairly natural river in certain sections. There are numerous times in the summer where there is no flow, right? and it's just a series of little shallow ponds. So if you take away what is the weir of the water crossing, it keeps that from completely disappearing. It, it sounds like we're going to get just you know a few little dribbles along the way there. And then when we get that four or five inch rain, it's going to be destructive as hell. So the in-stream structures are going to help uh, mitigate that concern of, of ad to address the erosion. And there's going to be pools, but there's going to be flow in between the pools. The continuous flow from the reuse water up, uh, that's put in upstream at Dragon Ridge Park is going to be pushing that flow through. Yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Hilary Saunders. Um, it, uh, this is my first meeting, so I apologize if I'm going backwards, but it, what I'm hearing is that what might be useful is a sort of cultural landscape story. And I don't know whether you could do that, but it would be very useful to have an overlay to me at any rate to say, Back in the 1920s, it looked like this. Back, I mean, this happened in the 1930s. I mean, this became the basis of the, the story as it progresses and an interpretive document. I'm so glad that you mentioned that. The Breckenridge uh, Park Conservancy, uh, yes. with assistance from the River Authority, has put together a cultural landscape report for Breckenridge Park that actually includes this section and documents its historic progression and then gives, gives recommendations, both from a historic point of view and an ecological point of view, about the appropriate protective measures to protect that history, protect the integrity of the river. And actually, one of the recommendations was a restoration, very, pretty much what we're discussing tonight. I think that would, that would be a very good opener to a meeting like this. It's just not finished yet. It, the uh, okay. Recognition Conservancy has not yet finished that report yet. Hopefully it will be available at the beginning of the year. They're just finalizing it now, and as soon as it's ready, then obviously we will come back and report that out. We just don't have that document yet. These two things are sort of moving together in time, uh, but yes, I mean, that's very, you're exactly spot on. Sort of that, that study is... Um, well, yes, we had on our team, we had the Lady Bird Johnson uh, Wildflower Center uh, helping uh, consult with us on some of the um, recommendations that are going to be put forth from the ecological perspective. So it's been a great uh, partnership between the River Authority and the Brackenridge Park Conservancy on looking more holistically at the history as well as the natural elements of this area. I think it would be very valuable to everybody that lives along this river to be able to see, or you guys to be able to present to us 
of what river restorations you have done and what they look like today, because all I'm hearing is what, what's going to be taken away, and I don't see any signs or, 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 or visual images of what Sarah has done and what the Army Corps of Engineers has done that, that would describe uh, before and after issues. Yeah, that's an excellent suggestion. Tell me, what impact does the Hildebrand drainage project have on your calculations? So we will account for that in the hydrology and hydraulics models. So when, when after we get past the feasibility study phase, which is what we're in now, and if funding is allocated at the federal level, then that will move us into the design phase. At the design phase, we'll be putting together hydraulic and hydrology models to run through and help design the restoration, basically the in-stream components, basically what you see there, and uh, any modifications to the stream. The Hildebrand drainage project will be accounted for within those models so that we know that they're working in concert with each other. <coughs> this in-stream modification, I'm not clear what that, you just call it in-stream modification, what does that mean? So there are specific techniques or best management practices uh, that we use as part of a stream restoration technique called natural channel design. And to most people, it just looks like a wonderful natural stream. But as an engineer, I look at it and I see the vegetation and I see the, the rock and I go, huh, that's a jade mode. That's designed to move the water so that the shear stress, the force of the water when it's coming down, is not straight on a bank, but it's moved into the center of the stream. So that the, the, it's mimicking what would happen over time in nature. So will this take any of the 35 structures that are in the floodplain, 100 year floodplain, out of the floodplain, or will it add any structures into the floodplain? So that's a really good question, and we need to be very clear from the get-go. This is an ecosystem restoration project. It cannot, by its funding mechanism, address flood control or flooding uh, intentionally. Uh, so if flooded before, we can't make it worse. Part of the, part of the funding is that, um, the requirement on that is that uh, flooding cannot increase. So that's kind of our bound. Um, we, we can't make it worse. If we make it better, that's great, but we, we can't use money specifically just to make it better. Thank you. Just a quick comment about the concept of ecosystem and restoration. This is a stretch of water in which which the, the, the life in the water, the, the aquatic life is really pretty healthy, but the water itself is, is, is quite clean most of the time, okay? So when we're really talking about ecosystem restoration, we're talking about stream bank, stream bank and protection, erosion control and sedimentation. And I want to be really clear that that's one item out of the three things that I really consider pertinent to this idea of ecosystems, right? That, that, that we have a stretch of water which is pretty healthy. And that's, I, Let's, let's keep our eye on that, too. Yeah. So if we want to yeah. talk specifically talk about... Sure. At, at Block, Aaron was talking about the in-stream structures. When you look at these, you're not going to be able to see. They're going to look like piles of rocks in the middle of the river. Um, but they're, like she said, they're engineered to uh, reestablish that equilibrium back into the river. Um, our second strategy is uh, modif modifying Avenue A. Um, either by removing Avenue A and uh, widening off the golf park path to uh, maintain, to, to allow access to the golf course uh, maintenance facilities, um, or to uh, keep the Avenue A down to where the uh, maintenance road goes off right now and remove everything uh, further down from that. Um, but that would be with controlled access because we're, we're wanting to control the use <laughs> uh, to keep it from degrading the habitat for them. So those are the two different combinations of things we're looking at on the east side. And, and in order, the, the ecological function of doing that would be that we're widening, widening out that uh, riparian buffer, that rivering habitat buffer that has a lot of benefits both as habitat as well as uh, ancillary uh, uh, water quality. Um, it's got to filter through a lot of vegetation 
um, it's before it enters the creek or Shrimp River, um, and so there's some water quality there. Where are you talking about? Where? So this is, yeah, on the east side where Avenue A is right now. The maintenance path. The maintenance path in between the golf course and the river, uh, the old Avenue A. So if you turn off from Mulberry on the east side of the river and go down to the turn, turn around near the Woodlawn Crossing, Avenue A. Okay. You know, that reminds me of something. There are three low water crossings on that river. I walk my dogs across that river every single day. And to have to go on a bridge where you're up above the river, where your dogs can't get down by the river, they can't drink out of the river, where a walker like me has no access to the animals and the birds and things that are around the river. When you remove those three low water crossings, you'll take away an immeasurable intimacy with San Antonio prison. So we're not necessarily going to remove access to the river, that's a part of the, the design process, but in that, in that spirit, please make sure that when we break out to the small group sessions that you get that comment written down and submit that so that we can make sure that that's part of the list that we can send. Well, I know that your, your, your pictures that you have on the tables and they show all of them show bridges way up high above the river where you have no intimate contact with them. Yeah, those aren't. Those were just examples of crossing. That's not what we're proposing or what we're doing. We're designing. Part of the design. Yeah. Yes. Is there a legal requirement that that golf course access exists on that side of the golf course? That's a conversation with uh, the city parks um, and recreation department and the, the golf course where we need to get together and collaborate to um, make sure that everyone can function um, as required. Sister, obvious question, but is any of this in preparation or in discussion with preparing for a report? Not that we want that, I'm just asking. Not to my knowledge. Okay. Our, our, our goal here is to restore uh, this section of the river so that we give it the best form and function so that it can function as a natural river and make it safe and enjoyable for the public. Just a quick question. Um, the alternatives here, and I know where the maintenance thing is. Are we going to have any parking for people who want to walk down here? Or what, what are we going to do with with the yeah. parking for it? Yeah. So would, it, would that be part of it if we do something up ahead, you know, with someone? So that's a really good question. We're going to address that um, at, in a couple of slides. And please make sure that when we get to our small groups that you uh, provide that in our recreation and protective elements so that we get the feedback and preferences um, down on paper. Again, with Avenue A, <clears throat> Is there any thought of putting ballards along it like they're along River Road and so that the trucks and the cars don't drive down to the river level? Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, that would be part of the access control to protect the restoration that we would implement in that area. So we'd be maybe not necessarily ballards, maybe it could be something more natural looking, but there would be some sort of access control um, to keep that from happening. Many years ago, we tried, we, this is, we've gone around, this is not our first show, but um, many years ago, we tried to get the golf course to move the pesticides and insecticides and all of that fertilizer from the banks of the river. So we're going to do this again now, we're going to spend all this money, we're going to restore the river, and we sort of have this, this ticking time bomb with the great next time your flood comes uh, on the banks of the river. Is there any thought of moving it yet again? Moving the, the, the golf course, all of their equipment is coming through that way. That's a conversation that uh, City Parks and Recreation is going to need to open up. We had this conversation, we got nowhere, eight, nine years ago. So on the other side of the river, we're looking at two different opportunities for uh, River Road. Um, the first would be the removal of the river road, uh, that, that small section that's marked there, and then opening up access on Allison Drive the way uh, it 
that used to be historically. And in order to do that, we can widen out that riparian area and plant uh, wooded uh, riparian vegetation in Allison Park. And the other opportunity would be to live, leave River Road in place and, and then still do the woodland riparian uh, vegetation in, in the park itself. So those would be the two uh, river road sides. We have two different combinations with the alleyway, and then we've got the stream restoration with the different handling of the different low water crossings differently on each one of those things. Quick question, is that movement in order to get it out of the floodplain, or is that to protect it from river erosion? Yeah. Eric, you want to talk? Yeah. That's kind of a so, so this is one of those interesting things. Um, right now, River Road is uncomfortably close to the, river, to the San Antonio River, and it's somewhat of a pressure point on the river. There's some notable erosion along, uh, along that section. Um, I, if you're familiar with uh, the erosion right next to Anastasia Place, so the, the road is acting as a pressure point, and that erosion is being exacerbated by it. So for this purpose, we are looking at the possibility Hey, what if we went and looked at the old historic Allison Drive? Could we could we make things better ecologically? Maybe. You know, we have to identify how much, how much it would cost. Was the Army Corps of Engineers involved in the massive uh, water retention uh, pond that was put in right there at Hill Friend underneath the made up photos? Was the Army Corps of Engineer involved in that? Was Sarah involved in that? What are you which project are you talking about? Underneath me and Lotus Park has a massive drain drainage. drainage. Oh, no, that's a city project. Has, has there been flooding since that was installed? Have you got records of the river flooding since all that massive uh, whole, whole water holding pond was put in? Because the flooding that was happening before, a lot of it was coming because they poured that water. I don't think you have the same money that you used to have. Yes. So um, I would like to ask a question about this river road moving. So what a lot of us have thought about for a lot of years is to stop the erosion there because there's all this build out that's happened in the flood drainage where we all call it engineering world. So this, pro this particular money could not pay for keeping the erosion at River Road and the Anastasia, for instance, right? So to the extent that addressing the erosion um, helps restore the ecosystem, yes, but a protection, let's say that, that someone had uh, the idea, we're just going to do an erosion project just for erosion's sake, uh, and we're not going to restore. These funds could not be used for that. So, if you, but let's just say that there were other funds that did address that, that we could acquire, and we would do this whole thing at one time. Would have you all done partnerships like that before? Yes, I think we have. Thank we've, you. We've, we've had multi partnerships to address uh, multiple uh, project goals before. Because there's a part up there where uh, towards between Mulberry and Anastasia where there's such erosion now that you could put a two-story bamboo hut which people have built in there and so I wish we had a picture of that by the way but um and we keep getting it taken out uh and but the thing is is that if, so if that erosion which is enormous over there could be controlled and then we wouldn't have to worry about moving river road correct if we were able to to restore the natural function and address the erosion, then it may not necessarily be that drastic of a need. But the question is going to have to, to be for the core team identifying the benefits, what it would cost one way versus another in order to get the, the appropriate or best bang for your budget. So just an issue of money. And, and how, it, how it just costs that. Well, that's easy. The pinch point you, put, you, you suggested is where Anastasia Place spills out in the river road, correct? So there's actually multiple pinch points yeah, or like but pressure points? The, the pinch point where the river is actually eroding the bank is right there where Anastasia Place spills out in the river road. And that it seems like the movement, the moving river road off there wouldn't do anything to the principal pinch point. So if you look at uh, where the, uh, the Tasagway is, which is 
Uh -huh. Maybe the slightly darker blue where the river kind of turns in. Uh, we're actually getting pretty close there and there's some significant erosion. That's another pinch point. Uh, river road is directly contributing to that one. So we would need to, uh, to address it somehow. Um, to, to your point. Also, that area there, just along that area, how the water flows is it's hitting that bank and it's starting to migrate a little bit um, and that's part of the erosion. So that's the pressure that I was speaking of. Yes, ma'am. Um, going back to an earlier concern, so if there's, this is federal money that's being used to restore the river, So Given that there are a lot of neighbors abutting the, the project, um, if one of them is using herbicides to treat the golf course and that runs off into the river, will that undermine the growth that you're trying to, to bring back so that you can restore the river? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. But, um, and that's one of the reasons why we want to expand that riparian width as much as possible because what that riparian area does is it absorbs nutrients and it filters out pesticides and herbicides. So the wider that we can make that riparian width, the, the better it is for water quality. So, that, so there'll be, it'll be a buffered area, but you'd obviously have more impacts on the outside. Than you and I have a follow-up question to that then. Is there, excuse my ignorance, but is there, is there a federal regulation on the level of herbicides that can go into a water, especially if you're using federal money, is there, is there monitoring that's happening so that something so that everyone's acting as a good a good neighbor? Yeah, but, and and it's and it's that's not for the federal government. It's the federal insecticide, fungicide, rodenticide act regulates the, the use of pesticides and herbicides. So you have to use them according to the label. So if the golf course is applying something. Uh, that has to be labeled for, for that use, and it can only be applied at that rate that's needed environmentally. Uh, What's acceptable. the name of that act again? Uh, <laughs> Federal <laughs> Insecticide, Fungicide, Rodenticide Act. And that's administered by the Texas Department of Agriculture. And EPA. And, 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 and as you golf course, again, I've had agronomists and horticulturists told to me that the golf course has all the permits and all the permissions to use all the Roundup the other chemicals that they want. So thank you to those, those laws and those rules. The golf course says they are within all, all their permits. If yeah. you were worried about moving a historic road like River Road, which is the gut of our neighborhood, if you were talking about moving it, it's so important for the river to be separated from the road that it was named after. It would seem to me to put gabions which is, a, which is a wire enclosure filled with rocks. You could lay gabions along that area that you're so worried about that would flood by Allison Road, or you could put a concrete wall there. There are a lot of ways that you could stop the road, the river, during flood times if there's going to be erosion of floods anymore, which I don't think there are, but if there are, you could put a concrete wall or gabions there to protect River Road from the water growth washing over that way. I think moving the River Road up on the gas station is an extreme measure that I would hope our neighborhood is very resistant to doing. Yeah, we provide that comment. And, and sometimes we have no choice but to use a hard structure like that to protect the bank and to ensure that we have that ecological value. Um, the goal is to try to use those natural processes as much as possible, but at some point you just have to use a hard structure. So just to make sure that everybody um, is aware, these are the three strategies where there's a couple of different options that are on the table for you to consider and provide feedback for. As the core goes through and considers your comments, does the cost-benefit analysis and dives deeper into it, they're going to put together a tentatively selected plan, which could include different combinations of what you've seen, or they may not choose to pursue an alternative just because it does not fit the project appropriately. So you have a wide range from no action at all to some combination of what you see. Um, in addition to that, uh, there's elements for recreation and protective measures, which Danny, if you would. Yeah. Yeah. So um, 
when we're doing ecosystem restoration is with any of our authorities with flood risk. We always have the opportunity after a plan has been selected to try to incorporate recreation features into the project as long as they don't impede upon the, the purpose of what that project is. So we can do things uh, like trails, we can do things uh, like uh, fishing piers or bird blinds. There's a lot of different things that we could consider. And, and that's one of the things we want to do in these round tables as well. I think there's actually recreation tables that you can go through and you can recommend some, some recreation features that you might like to see and then we can consider those to try to figure out if they are uh, compatible with the restoration uh, as well as the need uh, to do that. But you know we already have all those, right? Low water crossings, our fishing deck, sure. except on the banks, we have a pedestrian bridge, we've got trails, okay. Absolutely. And I mean, if there's, you know, we can think of a wide range of things that are there. Um, but and this is think, an ecosystem. And if you think what's there is sufficient, then you can say yeah. you don't want anything different. We've heard from some residents that they would like for their, maybe to improve the walkway or to, you know, not to make sure that people aren't backing their trucks up or their cars up to the banks and fishing off the, the tailgate, those kinds of things. If y'all are concerned about those things, you need to let us know if you feel like those are the kinds of things that would maybe uh, uh, be opportunities for improvements uh, that y'all would like to see. But if you think everything's fine, then you can say that as well. All right, so the next steps, uh, we, we take your comments from here, we go back and we fine tune a lot of our alternative development, and then a bunch of us will sit around and we'll go through this cost benefit analysis to identify what is within uh, the best use of taxpayers' dollars uh, for that restoration, and then select that plan or, uh, as our, our plan to go forward and present to our, uh, our leadership. Uh, after that, we'll submit the, the public document. We'll have another public meeting after that um, to present what that recommended plan going forward is. Um, and then we'll complete the feasibility phase of that with uh, uh, a decision document that should come out uh, the fall of next year. And then after that, the next step would be to wait on funding uh, for the planning or the engineering and the design uh, of, of that project. Sarah's about the river, and yet the people that are actually going to do the work, the bulldozers, the, the, all that, that's local people, are people from around here, as has been the project, all the projects that I've seen in the past. I don't understand why the Army Corps of Engineers is, what, what, what exactly is the involvement? Could you help us explain that? Sure. So the Army Corps of Engineers is authorized to do aquatic ecosystem restoration as well as flood risk management, deep raft navigation like the Port of Houston, uh, the Mississippi River navigation. We do uh, recreation on our lakes, water supply. The Corps has a lot of water related uh, authorities. And so ecosystem restoration is one of those authorities. So what we end up doing is we work with non-federal sponsors or local entities on helping them solve some of their water related needs. And we do that by cost sharing that with, like for this project, it's a 65 federal match with the 35 local sponsor match. So we do cost sharing on both the, the development of what that uh, project will look like, as well as the design and the construction we cost share with, with all of that. So we're a funding mechanism. We're also a technical uh, expertise uh, to provide that for uh, entities that don't have that expertise. We're really lucky to work with Sarah. Sarah has a lot of engineering expertise. They've got a lot of biological expertise. They've been doing this river work for a long time, and which is one of the reasons why we depend on them so much for that local expertise knowledge that they have with the community. So we rely a lot. The local people, the construction people, are the ones that actually do the hands-on work, right? It's however that contract and mechanism works out, but uh, the uh, those contracts are uh, uh, open bid to whoever wants to bid on those, and then there's a criteria that the Corps uses as far as a qualification. So just, just, just an observation, we have 45 minutes left, and I think a really important part of this meeting will be the breakout sessions. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's a ch chance for every voice to be heard. I just want to... Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm the time, please. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> to that note, we really want your written comments. You can provide them with the comment cards up front. We're doing these breakout workout sessions. We're asking for your comments on those and your input on those. Um, the address is on the cards, on the comment sheets. Please provide them. And I just wanted to say one thing. I'm Suzanne Scott. I'm the general manager of the San Antonio River Authority. I'm really very glad that everyone is here today. But just a couple comments before we get to the table. Uh, one is, obviously we're going through a process here. We've been, we have been looking at restoration on this part of the river for a very long time. And we've had uh, various opportunities with neighborhood uh, input to look at this. So that's why we're here. We've gotten all the, the players together to try to look at opportunities to uh, protect this river, the erosion, the issues that we've seen, everything that's been talked about here. But I want to make sure that y'all understand that as we go through this process, if we come up with a plan that this community is not going to support, then we're not going to force a project on you that you don't want. So please understand that. We want to go through a process. There are serious issues here that we've identified. We want to come up with opportunities to address them that are the best uh, opportunities that we can get the most support from the neighborhood. But again, this is part of your project too. We're not going to do this without your input, without your support. We're not going to uh, push this through. You've got a member of uh, the gentleman, Brendan, where are you, Brendan? He's with uh, Congressman Doggett's office. He and the, the uh, congressman is not going to want to move forward with trying to encourage funding if his constituents don't feel like this is the right uh, direction. But we want to go through the process because we've been talking about this, I think, since um, 2006. So it's time for us to figure out if there is something that we can do as a community to address the issues here. That's what we're here for. So we appreciate very much your input. And let's see if we can try to come up with some alternatives that may be different than what we've talked about here today, but that can also address these, these challenges that we see. So thank you all very much for being here. Thank you. So we're going to move to the, the table sessions at each table. We're going to have a facilitator who will walk you through. And so we're going to have a few minutes. Uh,
replacement of the Woodlawn Low Water Crossing uh, was the most popular idea expressed by the group. There wasn't much concern for the golf course low water crossings, but I think uh, it feels as though those are just for the golfers and they don't really use them. Um, and then uh, potential issues, of course, the loss of connectivity. Uh, I did hear someone mention, you know, uh, they saw someone pushing something in a wheelchair, so maybe ADA compliance, accessibility. Um, desire just to, to touch, feel, smell the waterfall over the Woodlawn um, Bridge. And so, very succinct. Thank you, So the three groups that I spoke with um, echo the same sentiment. It really stood out, number one, the Woodlawn Crossing stood out as being very important for a wide variety of reasons, uh, historical and cultural. Um, it is heavily used, as Abigail mentioned, by people and pets, and so keeping that pedestrian access element was a very important um, theme uh, through all three groups. Um, Another theme that uh, was common is that uh, folks want to keep uh, some deep pools. They don't want to see a very drastic change in the water levels, the size and scale overall. They want to still have a waterfall area at the Woodlawn Lake in particular, um, um, but they want to have deeper areas. They don't want to lose all the pools. Um, and they didn't feel like uh, they had enough information to really say anything about two or three. Um, they felt like it was kind of hands off, but none of them felt very strongly that uh, they were opposed. They weren't necessarily opposed to any change. Um, they, uh, there were uh, comments that they aren't maintained and that there's a need for modification probably on both of those, um, and they're ugly. So, uh, and then another um, item that was mentioned was safety. Um, for any modifications that are made, if there are culverts or other uh, ways for the water to go through, that they have some sort of safety measure to prevent pets or small kids or whatever from going in and, and maybe getting stuck. Um, so those were the big themes that were uh, some very consistent with Abigail's groups um, and a couple of different ones. So, two of my tables preferred uh, the idea of removing uh, Avenue A. Um, uh, both of those tables wanted a parking facility, uh, with trailhead being requested also by one of the tables uh, near the gate area. Um, and two of the tables, the same two, uh, were adamant that there not be um, the option for the widening of the maintenance trail, take that completely out, remove the road, add the pedestrian, get rid of the maintenance trail, the maintenance access, because ultimately the maintenance facility needs to be removed. So that was two tables. The third table liked all three of the components in that first option. They liked removal of Avenue A but they also saw the benefit of the expanded maintenance facility and they liked the uh, trail. Two of the tables, the first two, uh, that also liked uh, getting rid of the maintenance facility, did not want lights on the trail. The third wanted low impact lights. So we have a little bit of divide um, uh, with, with one option uh, seeming to be most popular, uh, but certainly a divide uh, with regard to Avenue A. Um, for River Road, no removal of River Road. Um, for two of the tables, for one, uh, keep it. Um, there was also a notation of the use of uh, the park area. And so a couple of the tables wanted to make sure that the vegetation was grasses so that the frisbee, et cetera, could be continued. But the other table uh, loved the woody area uh, that was in the vicinity. Uh, would like to see it thinned out uh, to provide a view and also to control homeless. So there was certainly not a, a consensus on the roadway situation. Josh? All right, and I had the other side of the room.
room for the transportation. Um, who, uh, going forward with Avenue A, um, one of the issues that was brought up was um, basically city participation in the conversation as well as um, the golf course and um, getting that ball rolling and um, seeing what, what, what we could actually do as far as widening their um, trail on their side. And then also, um, one of the issues that was brought up was enjoyment of the river. Um, if moving the trail, um, you're eliminating people being closer to the river, enjoying the river. Um, one of the issues that was also brought up was um, um, running a road, um, potentially the golf course between the greens um, to do maintenance on that side. Um, Lack of parking or conveniently um, close parking was also another one that was brought up. Um, one, one positive was elimination of cars along the river bank and potentially using boulders or some other natural um, looking feature like that to um, keep vehicles away from that. Um, one idea that was brought up also was um, a half access or mixed, ac mixed access. So basically having vehicles go approximately halfway up the trail or so and then um, Vehicles stopping there, having some parking on the opposite side from the river so that you're not having the vehicles close by the river, and then also having a um, pedestrian trail after that point um, was another idea that was brought up. Um, the, the main issue that came up on both of, or for, for Avenue A, was the parking issue. Um, and then moving on to River Road, the general consensus was that um, people did not want to get rid of River Road. Um, some of the issues that were brought up were the fact that it may not have actually been a full street in the past, it may have just been a little alley or cut through, um, so it's not really restoring to a natural fashion. And then also um, the traffic and congestion that could be caused and then people trying to beat lights and um, going through neighborhoods and then um, and then traffic bottlenecking, yeah. So traffic was the main issue that was brought up for that. And then um, Going back to Avenue A, also another issue um, that I forgot to mention was parking in the neighborhoods and people um, driving to the neighborhoods more. Thanks, Josh. Christine? So I would do, speaking to everyone, uh, this side of, of the oh, room, yes. talking about recreation potential for either um, adding new features or preserving what was there. Um, there's a general consensus and everyone I spoke to that uh, the key component of the river through here is you know the peace and quiet and the na natural state and it's really important to the neighborhood to maintain that natural state um, regardless of what improvements or alternatives we choose you know that's that's very important to the community um, maintaining um, you know birding bird watching um, walking uh, running with your dog um, that's a lot that occur a lot of that activity occurs, and we'd like to maintain that. Uh, but as was mentioned earlier, you know we don't want it to become a next river walk. So limiting the lighting, limiting the signage. Um, there's also some comments to maybe add some, um, you know, select locations, adding some uh, signs that either talk about the historical nature of the river or highlight some of the um, cultural or history of the. Um, you know, ecosystem or identifying some of these natural grasses that will be potentially restoring, um, but it, it's all you know very limited or selective because the natural state of it is really important. Um, so, in the general scheme of things, um, not the community didn't really feel a strong need to add additional features, whether that be uh, fishing decks or uh, more trails. Um, it's really what's there now is, is functioning well for the neighborhood and just maintaining the state of it. First of all, I want to thank everyone for all of your input and your comments. It was great to listen to y'all tonight. Uh, your voices are very important, so uh, thank y'all so much. Just like Christine had mentioned before, uh, some of the major things that were discussed in our tables was parking itself. There's parking issues, I guess, throughout the whole stages that, that, that we were talking about tonight. But we do definitely, uh, what the ring across was, it's got to be small parking. No parking garages or anything of that nature, but limit the parking size itself. Um, the walking trails, of course, is, is one of the big things. The walking trails was 
there's something there, but we want to go ahead and put something in there, improve what's, what's out there, but definitely do not want concrete paved type of thing. Maybe crush rock or whatever uh, mulch or whatever other alternatives out there, but they do not want paving. Paving because of the fact that they do not want biking going through the area itself. Too much biking traffic right, would, would create a lot of uh, traffic there itself. Um, some of the other things that we're talking about was possibly add, add, adding some more access points to, to the area itself. Um, there was some 50-50 type of thing that we want to go ahead and add some fishing piers or decks of that nature. Some others did not. Uh, but definitely something to, to kind of look at in, in the general areas there itself. Um, some of the other things that the concern was with the lighting as, as well, but they want to be uh, maybe limiting the hours of access there itself, kind of like what city parks have right now, where you can only access the park from you know from a certain time, and if you're in there, then hopefully policing that area so that they try to eliminate the, that that type of uh, activity going on in that too. Be respectful to the property owners that, that are there itself. So. Uh, definitely want to look at that itself. They did talk about making sure that the walking trails are ADA accessibility itself, making sure that, that we have to consider consider having that uh, place in there in itself. And then improving the, the areas with the walking trails and so forth, we got to look at the, the trash aspect of it. It's, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of heavy tra trash in there, so improving anything in there, whether it be the walking trails or parking, whatever it is, we need to look at that trash aspect of it. Definitely want to keep the area clean um, and uh, with any type of improvement out there. So, and that's pretty much what I have. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the birdies. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank, <laughs> thank you for reminding me. Of. So they do they want to look at the birdies itself. They want to go in and, and, and put them those observation decks and uh, bird uh, accessibilities. But one comment that was brought up that there's some issues with some feral cats in the area. So. Handling that type of situation first is going to be very important to go ahead and be able to put those little bird observation uh, points out there because, you know, without taking care of those cats, we wouldn't have any birds around to be, to be able to enjoy and have that. So. But also the staging of the removal of the invasive species. To do that over a three to four year period and, and away from migration times, I represent the Year Audubon Society, and we do a lot of uh, bird walks in that area construction and it's a really it's a it's called a hot spot it's yes. where people come and and to see warblers coming in and things like that there are wood ducks so that habitat we so have a gentle hand when it comes to not just come in with bulldozers and it's migration time and mm -hmm. absolutely and that would be something that we would definitely look at absolutely we did i did take your comment if we have more thank so you absolutely all right thank you Thank you all so much for your participation tonight. It was a very lively conversation. Um, we have your comments. I would like to remind you that you can submit uh, written comments to either on the, the forms and hand it to a Sarah or a uh, core staff member. You can also submit uh, an email to the River Road ER uh, email address that is either on a comment form or on the small little business card for the project um, to if you something occurs to you. So we're going to break and if you still have questions, please do not be afraid to come talk to us um, and we can have individual conversations with Just you. one important general question I have started to interrupt. We have a 30 day period uh, for public comment uh, the last couple weeks or over the holidays and so I would ask um, if there's any way that we could get a consolidated version uh, of all the comments right. made within the 30 day period yeah. to then yeah. understand yeah. what is missing to then make a comment on. Clay, can you address that process? Normally, the uh, draft environmental assessment will have the comments in the, and then the uh, time to see all those will be in there. Is there a way to get the video recording prior to 30 days? Uh, I don't control what oh, yeah. it'll be up right away. Because that's not awesome. But I think that, you know, we hear this from you that you all have a process. We talked about this. Uh, but we need response back from all of the input. It was an aggregation of it uh, from you all. Five or 30 days to get a comment. Right. We have 30 days, so then you would have 30 days, maybe. 
But we did this in August, and we didn't hear anything until last week. And so we need we need your you know we need to have that response too. Yeah. Typically, we don't respond yeah, prior to the public meeting. But we, we did that because we wanted we wanted to uh, address those questions. Right. Because a lot of those comments are things that we're already considering and already. Doing. Well, then that's all you have to put. But yeah. we need feedback for our feedback. I was just going to say the comments that have been collected from here today at this meeting are those going to be compiled in any sort of publicly available fashion? Just the things that were noted down. I didn't know how those were. So the, the comments provided on these comment forms or an email and stuff, that's going to be in our um, draft environmental assessment. So the official written comments, are, and we usually kind of group those together. We don't single anybody out. Your name's not going to be with your comment or anything like that. We group those in a similar um, categories or respond like that. But um, yeah, the things that, uh, if, you, if you're not writing it down for us, we can't do all the verbal. But the notes on the maps are the notes on the map, what we'll do is we'll, we'll compile all of the, we'll transcribe and compile all those notes and we'll provide it to the core team. Um, so they'll consider it just like a written comment. So it will be in their list to respond to. All right. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to make an announcement about uh, the recording today. So now past has been recording all of this and it will be available in a couple of days in a couple of days for all of us to watch so they provide a very important community service and neighbors got together in order to make this possible today so we would like to request that anybody that would like to help support this important service <coughs> contribute to nowcast and your donations will be doubled between now and the end of the year and i have the information uh, what is the expected contribution date for EIS? It's not going to be EIS, it's just going to be an environmental assessment, and that will come out with uh, that late uh, fall 2020 date. Okay, and then are y'all expecting to do EIS? No, we're not expecting to do that. But the GSP is spring time Yes, March or so. So the draft report will be coming out. There's a 30 day. I'm curious. I, I don't know what we have 30 days to respond to what. I'm not sure yeah. what we're responding to. Uh, and I feel like the clock is so, tipping, and so I don't know what I'm doing. 30 days is just an extension of tonight. If something occurs to you that you didn't, you didn't feel you got out, or hey, I didn't think of that. That 30 days is just a an extension of hey, let's get it in there, and it just provides us with a an easy way to say okay, here's one bunch of comments. That provided at this state, at, at this state of the project. So we're responding then to the maps that we saw tonight? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Are we also responding to, to things like the, the other questions we have that, that have been dealt with? Yes, please provide, um, provide that in, uh, comment into the email. And I'd like to ask one more thing. And that is, is that the last two meetings, August and today, the neighborhood has uh, provided this uh, video uh, for for everybody's purpose, and and I'd like to know if you all will provide it for the rest of them. So for, to provide the nowcast, you know that's certainly a conversation, Brian. Uh, <coughs> we can um, we can look into our budget and see if we have the availability. Um, I know that we did not. Um, at the beginning of our fiscal year, plan to video public meetings. We generally have not done that on other projects, um, but we will consider it. Great, thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all very much. Merry Christmas. I think those of us that have additional comments and questions, please just stick around with the meetings. Come on. There's more comment pages at the front of the room. Hopefully, we'll get some, and I'll send it out. I'll send it out.